Sorry, I was a little behind the gun there. My name's Nathan. I'm one of the pastors here. Thank you so much uh, for spending part of your weekend with us. I saw a lot of new faces. Uh, listen, in that seat back pocket in front of you, there's a care card. Um, and again, I, I know I mention this every, uh, every Sunday morning, but it's a, God has chosen his sovereignty and his providence to use that little card in a mighty way. Um, if you've got any questions, um, if you're struggling with anything, uh, please, it'd be a huge favor to us. Um, if you'd fill out that care card and either Ryan Sisney uh, or myself will reach out to you uh, this week, answer any questions you may have. We've got a baptism service coming up in, in a few weeks. We're excited about that. Maybe that's your next move. Uh, if you're in Christ uh, and you've not been baptized, I, that's your next move, period. So if you, if you wanna pray through that or you wanna talk to Ryan or myself about is baptism my next move in my walk with Jesus, hey, fill out that care card. Um, or maybe you want to serve. Uh, we got a lot of opportunities. If you missed uh, last week's uh, service, um, we launched our student ministry. And so what is that going to look like? Uh, a week from today uh, at 10 a.m., uh, if you're 6th through 12th grade, uh, we would love to meet you in the students' room, uh, basically right across from the front entrance, uh, right across my lobby. Nathan, what's it going to look like? I'll tell you exactly what it's going to look like. Uh, we're going to build relationships that'll bear the way to truth, and then we're going to point these young adults to Jesus. Amen. That's exactly what it's going to look like. I promise you. Um, it's incredibly simple. Uh, it's not easy because we really oftentimes want to insert our own strategy into it, our own brains into it. Listen, folks, a light reading of the New Testament. It is building a relationship that'll bear the weight of truth and then pointing these young people to Jesus Christ and him crucified. It is literally that simple. And that's what it's gonna be. And so if you wanna be part of that, hey, please fill out a care card. It's like I said last week, there is no way that the Mitchells and the Revises and Ryan and I can do this on our own. There's no way. That's what y'all are in here for. Thank you. So somebody's called. Somebody is called to help. So fill out a care card. So the real Jesus. Um, super excited about this series. Um, we're going to go verse by verse through the book of Mark. Um, which Jesus are you following? Which Jesus are you following? If you want to call yourself a Christian, some people call it evangelical. I've got one question. You're either in Christ or you're not. Over 170 times Paul uses that term, in Christ, in the beloved, in Jesus, in his letters to the church. Are you in Christ? Are you God's kid? And are you following the real Jesus? Because there's not this homeboy Jesus. There's not this American Jesus. God doesn't care about our constitution, y'all. We've got to get back to the scriptures. The scriptures are the only truth. I don't care what our government says. I don't care what Republicans or Democrats say. I don't. I care about Jesus Christ and him crucified. So at this time, I'm gonna ask you to do something a little bit weird. I'm gonna ask you to kind of do this. And let's start dusting off the tradition. Let's just shake it off. Let's shake off the tradition because guess what? I'm not concerned with what your mom and daddy told you. I'm not even concerned with what I've told you. I am concerned with what the very word of God says. This is the real Jesus. And that's how we're gonna go verse by verse through the book of Mark because Mark is writing. Almost every church father and theologian agrees that Mark is, he wrote this from Rome and he's writing it to the Gentile Christians in the Roman city that were under crazy persecution from Nero, the likes of which we've not seen. And so he, he writes it to, to encourage the believers simply by telling them who Jesus is. And he also helps us understand Jesus' total call to our own self-abandonment and discipleship to follow him. What does it cost to follow Jesus? Jesus, everything. And so I'm, we're, we're gonna cover verses one through eight today. And the first verse is pretty much the only time Mark tells us his opinion. He says, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the son of God. Now, the gospel here, when we hear the word gospel, we think one of the first four books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we think of the good news, okay? Okay. Here's what we got to understand. And this is where I say dust off tradition, 
okay? Because Christians are not the ones to coin this term, the gospel. We're not. It was around uh, for many years uh, before that. And so I want to put the Greek of it on here. It means good news or good and glad tidings. And to the Jews, remember, there were two people, two people groups in the world, basically. There was God's people, the Jews, the Hebrew nation, the Old Testament people of God, and then there were the Gentiles, okay? To the Jews, this would have been a staggering statement. Because sometimes in the Old Testament, the Hebrew equivalent of this Greek word was sometimes used of a massive military victory, but not often. Mostly what it was used for and what it was most known for was to announce the news of the Messiah. And nowhere, no prophet uh, proclaims this more than the prophet of Isaiah. And he says in Isaiah 40, go up to a high mountain, O Zion, Herald of good news, exact same Hebrew word of the Greek word that, uh, that Mark uses here. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good news. Lift it up, fear not. Say to the cities of Judah, behold your God. So when Mark echoed out this first verse, the Jewish nation would have been like, oh my goodness, the Messiah is coming. God had been silent for almost 400 years. Imagine that. He spoke through all the major prophets and the minor prophets in the Old Testament. That was just incredible. And since the book of Malachi, God had been silent for almost four centuries. Imagine how perplexed the Jewish nation must have been. Isaiah says in a few chapters later in Isaiah 40, behold, the Lord God comes with might and his arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. And again, that good news is the exact same word. It's more than just a military victory. It's the, it's the coming of the Messiah. It makes it the best news possible. But here's the thing. This term wouldn't have just resonated with Jews. It would have resonated with Gentiles. You see, there's an inscription that archaeologists have uncovered. You can read about it that was about 9 BC, that announced the birth of Caesar Augustus, who, who was supposed to be the divine holy one, the king. In other words, it was a capital offense in Rome during those days to not worship Caesar. That's what got a lot of the early church in trouble is because they refused to worship Jesus because we worship Jesus Christ and him crucified. But the inscription on it, it had glad tidings, an announcement of this king of Rome. And so the, even to the Gentiles, it would carry this meaning of literally a new situation for the world. Like the situation of the world has literally changed. It would have been the announcement of a royal pronouncement. The most powerful monarch on earth has arrived. And it would usher in a new order of salvation. And so under the inspiration of Holy Spirit, Mark uses this word to announce the arrival of the king. You see, he wants to make sure there's no mistake that every word points to the person and work of Jesus Christ and him crucified. Every bit of it does. Now, the gospel is not simply a method of changing uh, our life or receiving salvation. We got to understand that is not the intent that Mark used when he wrote this. It's not how we get a personal relationship with God. No, no, no. When a new king has come and a new monarch has conquered an area, the people there tremble because the king is now in rule. And so those who want to who wanna have a relationship with the king, it causes them uh, to bow their knees in submission and authority to him. That's the kind of wording that Mark is using here when he says the word gospel. He is writing about the conquest and the triumph of a new king. You got to remember, it was hundreds of years later before our canon of the 66 books that we have here at Hendersonville Church and, and evangelical churches have, before Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were called gospels. And again, we have got to look at the text the way God meant it to be looked at. And so it's the announcement of the king. Well, who is the king? Well, Mark makes sure there is no confusion on that. The second part of verse one, of Jesus Christ, 
the Son of God, I literally could preach a series on this right here. I could. I'm not going to, but I could. Here's the thing. The name Jesus, it, 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 the, the Hebrew uh, equivalent of it meant Yahweh is salvation. And so it was, it was a long time before it was prophesied that he would be called Jesus. You got to remember how Jesus even got here. He was born of a virgin. And, and that she was engaged. She was betrothed to a man named Joseph. And so Joseph was agonizing over what he should do. His, his, his fiance that he hadn't been with was, was with child. And so he was contemplating about issuing her a certificate of divorce, which under the Old Testament law, he was completely justified in doing so. And an angel of the Lord comes to him and, and tells him, no, no, no. No, the Holy Spirit has caused this to be happened. And then he tells Joseph this, she will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. Again, folks, this is fulfilling another prophecy from 700 or so years before in Isaiah where he would be called Emmanuel, God with us, that Greek equivalent. And what it is is Jesus. And it's incredible the way all this happens. And so again, we're gonna unpack who the real Jesus is today, some, some clear aspects to help us understand his words and actions as we go through these beautiful chapters and go on this journey with Mark through his account of Jesus. So the first thing of Jesus is this. Jesus is 100% man. This is huge. Jesus is 100% man when he walked this earth. And again, if we got any questions about a verse in scripture, where's the first place we should go? It's not Google. It's back to the scriptures because we know that scripture will never contradict scripture. Again, 66 books written by 40 authors over 1,500 years across three continents and there's not one textual contradiction in it, not one. And so John's account, the apostle John, he says in, in, in verse 14 of the first chapter, he said, and the word, meaning Jesus, became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the Father, full of grace and truth. And again, remember, God had been silent for almost 400 years. But when the right time arrived, when the perfect time arrived, Paul words this beautifully uh, to the churches in Galatians, Galatians 4, 4, I love this. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son. And this is huge, y'all. This is huge. Born of woman, born under the law to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. You see, here's the thing, folks. We don't serve some Buddha. We don't serve some unbelievable king that was born in some sort of royalty on the, in the west wing of a mighty palace. Guys, we, 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 we worship the king of king and lord of lords who came down here and was born a baby in a manger who was tempted and tried in every way we were. The writer of Hebrews, listen, this is beautiful. Hebrews 1, 3, listen to this. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. You've got to bury that in your brains and in your soul and your mind. Let us then, because of that, because Jesus did that, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Listen, folks, only because God took on flesh does it give us the ability to be conformed and more and more into his image through Jesus Christ. It's because God became flesh and dwelt among us. We cannot forget that. And that's what Jesus' humanity is huge. And we're gonna get into this more and more and more as we venture into the book of Mark. The next thing about Jesus, he's the Messiah. The Messiah. You gotta remember, he said Jesus Christ. Christ is not his last name. It's a title. And the Hebrew word of that is Messiah. And here it is in the Greek right here. It means the anointed one, the Messiah. And here's the thing. You, you can read about the Old Testament prophecies of the Messiah coming in, in like Daniel 9 and Isaiah 9 and Isaiah 11 and Isaiah 61. All those point 
And these were written hundreds of years before Jesus came on the scene. And they describe perfectly what he did. It's absolutely remarkable. Because again, remember, everybody was looking for the Messiah. Everybody was looking for the Messiah. You know, Peter, his, his brother Andrew, he, he actually saw Jesus before Peter did. And Andrew was amazed by it. And listen what Peter does. He runs back to Peter and it says this. He first found his own brother Simon, that's Peter, and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which means Christ. One of my favorite encounters that Jesus has is with a woman in a well. You can read about it in John 4. It's amazing. She's an outcast. She's, she's one of the lowest of the lows. God uses her story, uses her, her testimony to literally save an entire village. It's remarkable but Jesus is tired. It's at the high noon of the day and he's tired because he's completely man and he's tired, he's wore out. And this woman shows up and she's by herself, which means honestly, it's at the high time of the day. She's by herself contextually. She wasn't with other women. Therefore, she was an outcast. And so she starts having this dialogue with Jesus because he asked her for a drink of water, which is so countercultural today. A Jewish man would never talk to a Samaritan woman. And she can't believe, well, how is it that you, a man that's Jewish, talks to me, a woman? And they have this dialogue back and forth. And she starts asking him uh, uh, theological questions. And he starts talking to her and it, it perks her interest. And then she says this, the woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming. You know what's interesting there? Just, I, I, I like the grammar, the way the Greek is. It, it's kind of cool. Did you notice how she doesn't say the Messiah? I know Messiah is coming. It's a person. He who is called Christ, when he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Jesus knew exactly who he was. Jesus made no bones about who he was. Any Jewish reader would have known the implications when Mark wrote Jesus Christ. But then there's one more of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, which means Jesus is 100% man, he's the Messiah, he's also 100% God. This is huge. When we go back to those verses, tempted in every way we were, yet without sin. He was God, he never sinned. He lived the perfect life because we can't. And so the Son of God, what that does is sets up for the readers. Again, this is the very first verse. You're like, my goodness, he said we're doing seven more verses. Are we going to get out of here anytime soon? Just bear with me. We'll be all right. We'll be out of here by one. Don't worry about it. But he says, he says the son of God, it gives his right to rule. Y'all remember Jesus is one in nature. He is co-equal and co-eternal with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. And again, scripture makes this clear. How many times do I sit up here and say, you are entitled to your own set of opinions? You are. You're just not entitled to your own set of facts. Scripture's fact. John says in his first verse coming out, this is the apostle John. In the beginning was the word, that's Jesus Christ. And the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him and without him was not anything made that was made. Jesus Christ made everything. When Paul writes to church in Colossae, he wants to make sure there's no confusion. He says in chapter two, verse nine, for in him, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. It's, 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 God's scripture's clear. The Pharisees, the religious elite, the Sanhedrin, the Sadducees, the, the religious elite that were of the time that were revered by, by the population, they couldn't stand Jesus because he made him out, he made himself out to be God. And John even tells us about this. This is why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. The writer of Hebrews, again, crystal clear on this, talking about Jesus. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. This man who was born in a manger, lowest of the low, who allowed himself to go to the cross and become sin for us, is the exact imprint of God's total nature. Wow, we've got to marvel at that. 
We've got to marvel at that. And he upholds the universe. I I love, he doesn't say by his power. He says simply by the word of his power. That's how strong Jesus is. It's remarkable, y'all. We got to get excited about it. Jesus is 100% God. He's 100% man. He's the Messiah. This is all going to become crucial as we navigate through the book of Mark. He continues in verse two, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. So as it is written, that was a common reference, especially of the apostles, whether it was whether it was Paul or whether it was John or whether it was Peter or whether it was James to say, as it is written, to quote the Old Testament. And so that was super common. Now, what Mark's doing here, he is quoting two Old Testament pack, uh, passages here, one from Malachi and one from Isaiah. And so it wasn't uncommon that when someone says, as it is written, they would reference the greater of the two prophets. And so Isaiah obviously was, a, was called one of the great major prophets. Malachi was referred to as one of the minor prophets. And so it was common for that to happen. And so the first one he mentions is Malachi. And it says, behold, I send my messenger and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. And so preparing the way. So what Mark's talking about here is a messenger a herald almost, someone that was going to prepare the way of a monarch, which was common at that time. And so we're gonna get in that in just a moment when we reach a guy named John the Baptist. But it's crazy because he doesn't just say just any king. He says the Lord will suddenly come. He's talking about God. He's not preparing it for just some old earthly king. He's preparing the way for God to come to his people. It's amazing. And then the the verse of Isaiah he quotes is this, Isaiah 43. It says, a voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Now, now here's the thing. When it says prepare a way and make straight, what he's talking about there is spiritual path, the spiritual path. In other words, turning away from sin and turning towards God righteousness. That is called repentance. That is a big word. That is a word you hear up here a lot. That is a word you're going to continue to hear a lot because without repentance, there is no remission of sins. There must be repentance. And that's what the messenger was sent that was prophesied for 700, 800 years. Now, here's the other thing that's cool with him referencing these Old Testament passages. Jesus is coming. wasn't accidental. It wasn't an afterthought because I say this with extreme reverence. Our sin created a massive conundrum for our God. Now, again, I say that with reverence because God couldn't just say, all right, well, I know y'all are sinners. Just come on up to heaven and hang out with me. He, He couldn't do that because of how holy and righteous he is. It would have reduced his holiness. There had to be a perfect sacrifice and payment to satisfy the beautiful, holy and righteous wrath of God. That's why we had a king come that was 100% man, tempted and tried in every way we were, 100% God, never sinned, was perfect and was the Messiah. God had this thing planned out from eternity past before the foundation of the world was ever even created. Now, it may seem weird to some that Mark mentions the, the messenger here before the king. But that was very common because here's the thing. In those days, again, we got to look at the context and what it was, and how it was written. In those days when monarchs would come to the land, they would send an entourage ahead of them. And there would be a royal announcer. And that royal announcer would have security detail. He'd have all sorts of things. He would even, he would even remove physical debris and make sure that there was a safe and secure path for the monarch. And if not, he would send word back, say, hey, hold up a little bit. I got to deal with this situation. And so it was very common. Here's the thing. The forerunner here, we're getting ready to learn his name. He wasn't clearing physical debris. Oh no. No, he was imploring us to clear our minds and our souls of debris, of, of, of obstacles to keep us from having our eyes on the one true God. That's what he was doing. 
And so we see this in the fourth verse, John appeared. Now this is not the apostle John who wrote the the other gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. It's not him. This is John the Baptist. He was referred to in those days as the baptizer, okay? Two different Johns. John appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of what? Repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Now, here's the deal. We gotta understand what this baptism of repentance means because this is a big, 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 big deal, okay? Here's the thing. John's baptism was a one-time act and it was foreign to that time. The only thing close to it was when Gentiles would convert to Judaism. They would go through this one-time washing ceremony where they would reject paganism and reject their sinful ways and commit to following God, Yahweh, the God of the Old Testament, which is the exact same God of the New Testament. And so basically this was common for Gentiles, but to ask Jews to do it would have been radical. It would have been unheard of for Jews to be asked to reject their ways and get themselves ready for their God to come. Because here's the thing, here's what it calls them to understand. Regardless of your lineage, regardless of your practices, regardless of your religiosity, you are unfit for the kingdom of God, period. And we now know outside the blood of Christ. Now they wouldn't have known that yet. They would not have known that yet. But being neither Jewish nor even a Pharisee or adhering to strict pharisaical laws would make them fit to gain heaven. Instead, what was required was a change of heart. It was repentance. That's what was required. And and it, it implies the complete change of one's mind to head in the opposite direction. If you look at this Greek here, that meta carries the the term. If you look at metaphysics, it's kind of after or beside or to turn. And then noia comes from the Greek word nous, which is mind. It's a complete change of the mind and heart and transformation. And basically it carries this connotation to change one's way of life as a result of the complete change of our mind and thought and attitude towards sin and righteousness. It causes a complete change. Here's the thing though, it's not just intellectual. And again, you hear me say this, and I get it, might bend some people out of the frame. I don't care how much scripture you got memorized. I don't. You'll never have as much memorized as Satan does. Never. He knows it backwards and forwards. He knows it in the Hebrew. He knows it in the Greek. He knows it in the, in the Septuagint. He knows all of it. It's a heart change. It's an emotional change. It's visceral. It's to give you this sense of almost this healthy uh, conviction, which is kind of like a remorse and a sorrow for your sin against God. And it's, it's remarkable. And here's the thing. The Old Testament prophets talked about this all the time. And again, they're talking about a complete and total change, a complete conversion. Now you gotta remember something. The people that God, especially Jesus on earth, went after the most were the ones from an earthly standpoint seemed the farthest away from him. Galilean fishermen, a zealot, a tax collector. It's remarkable. The people who seem closest to God the Pharisees, the religious elite, the Sadducees, the Sanhedrin, were the farthest away. You gotta remember, it's not your distance from God. It's the direction you're headed. Where are you headed? Are you headed towards God, being conformed more and more and more into his image, or are you turning away? You've got to remember that true repentance is a complete transformation of one's nature and it only comes via the Holy Spirit, via God's grace. It is not anything we do. It is a gift from God. One of the coolest accounts of this is when Peter, he he goes to the Gentiles, to a dude's house named Cornelius and he watches these Gentiles receive the Holy Spirit and he's blown away and he goes back to Jerusalem to report it to the people called the Judaizers, uh, the ones that were staunch in their Jewish religion. They couldn't imagine that God would count Gentiles worthy. But Peter explains all this to him. He says, man, who am I? Who am I to get in the way of God's plan? And listen how God changes their, their hearts. When they heard these things, they fell silent. That Greek there, they started contemplating. 
And then they glorified God saying, then to the Gentiles also, God has granted repentance that leads to life. Again, folks, until there's repentance, we've got to repent. It's not asking Jesus into your heart. It's not. I'm sorry, I know that makes some people feel offended, but it's, that's not what this teaches. And I've got to teach what this teaches. And you know, Paul made this clear when he wrote to the church in Corinth. He said, for godly grief, that Greek there's like conviction. It's that healthy conviction that the Holy Spirit gives you produces a repentance that what? What does it do? Leads to salvation without regret. Whereas worldly grief, that's guilt, that's shame, thinking I can't be good enough, produces death. Here's the thing, folks. Sometimes I enter the trap of my flesh and the enemy where I feel guilty or I feel ashamed of my past or what I've done. Listen, here's what I know though. Guilt and shame should have no place in a Christ follower. It's done. It's washed clean in the blood. Done. But conviction is a beautiful evidence of the Holy Spirit. And for the Jewish people that John the Baptist called, their initial evidence of that would be to submit to baptism. And here's the thing, the self-righteous and prideful would have never, would have never agreed to do this baptism ritual. They wouldn't have. Because John was proclaiming a baptism of repentance to come out to the wilderness. Number one, it's in the wilderness. It would have been highly inconvenient. It would have been highly inconvenient for them to have come out there. And here's the thing, John's proclaiming this repentance to clear the way. Now, John the Baptist was a fireball and his preaching was, it was, I mean, it was convicting. I mean, he focused on judgment and divine wrath. That's what John the Baptist focused on when you read scripture. One time he's baptizing and the religious elite just come to check it out. And listen to what he says to them. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, I'm just going to tell you, contextually, there's not a more insulting term here. There's not. You brood of vipers. Who warns you to flee from the wrath to come? Folks, when we hear about God's wrath, we think something negative. It's not. It's beautiful. You're like, Nathan, you're crazy. No, I'm not. He's holy. His wrath is beautiful. When I'm in Christ, guess what? I don't receive any of his wrath. None. Again, it's why I say you're either a child of God or you're a child of Satan. Which one are you? Well, Nathan, that's offensive. That's, that's what scripture teaches. That's what it teaches. You're either a child of God or a child of Satan. That's it. John's fiery sermons force people to address their sin. When's the last time we've ever addressed our sin nature? And again, I'm not talking about guilt and shame. That's got no place amongst us who are in Christ. We're free from it, but to at least acknowledge it and know the holiness of God. Because here's the thing. It's like Ryan said a couple of weeks ago. If there's good news, what's there also got to be? Bad news. Before they could hear the good news of salvation, they needed to hear the bad news of their sin and their, and their separation from God outside of the Messiah. They had to hear it. John was preparing the way. And John the apostle, he words it this way in his letter to the church. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And to what? Wow cleanse us from all, not most, not 99%. Listen, folks, there is not an ounce of unrighteousness in me, not because of anything I've done, but because of what Christ did at the cross. His blood has washed me clean. Are you washed clean? Are you God's kid? It's only through this, through this genuine faith and repentance could their sins be forgiven. And listen to the result. This is amazing. And all the country of Judea and Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. What a humiliating act these people had to go through. First off, they had to travel there. It's not like they could get in their car, type on maps, uh, river Jordan, where John the Baptist is, <laughs> navigating now. Okay, we'll be there in 15 minutes. No, 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 they had to walk. And then they had to get in this river and confess their sins. And it, here's the thing. It says all. I, the original Greek says all. I looked at it. The Alexandrian and the Byzantine text. It says all. I, I, imagine the humiliation that was being done and how, listen, how much do you think this pleased God? Think about it. He was preparing the way. And here's the thing. This, John wasn't proclaiming something that was works-based or, or legalism. No, no, no. Here's the thing for John and his hearers, John the Baptist and his hearers and for us is can we know that when our king comes back, 
Are we vindicated? Are we justified? Are we God's kid? And that's what John is proclaiming here. They believed what John said. They then acted on their belief. Now listen what John was, listen about who John is. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt and around his waist, or around his waist, and ate locusts and wild honey. Now this is a short description. Let me tell you something. This dude was quite a character. He would have been shocking to the people. He is the messenger, the herald that is prophesied about for hundreds of years that God Almighty chose to prepare the way for Jesus Christ and him crucified. And this is the way he looked. Now, I could get into a bunch of theological stuff. We're gonna address the fact that he's just like Elijah in about four or five chapters. But here's what you need to know. His lifestyle was radically different from the religious elite at the time. The religious elite at the time had the finest linens you can imagine, lived in the finest homes, were basically revered by, by, the, by the common people. And it's clear, John didn't care about that stuff. He didn't care about any of the finer things in life. Now, I wanna be careful. Is it wrong to have finer things in life? I, as long as you don't put them between you and God. The second you put them between you and God, you may not on your own sin. If you long to have that bigger boat or that bigger account or that bigger RV or that kid to have a better college or, or bigger house, whatever, and you're putting that ahead of God, then yeah, it's sin. But, but I can do that with, with much less. So I want, John never told people to be like him. But his lifestyle forced the people to take a hard look because the people at that time, a light reading of, of, of extra scriptural uh, literature in that time, the people envied the spiritual elite because of what they got, because of how they acted, because of where they lived. They envied them. So John forces them and forces us, take a hard look. Take a hard look. What course are you on? Because I'm telling you, the worldly advantages are one of the biggest enemies of the church. We're not persecuted here. We persecute ourselves through comfort. We do. I mean, if I said, hey guys, we're gonna meet at five in the morning, our services, we're gonna to move to nine, five in the morning. I think it's a great thing to do. How many people would be here? I'm just saying, John forces us to look at that. I'm not saying it's a sin issue necessarily, but it easily could be. And it was for me for decades. And I still struggle with it. But his goal was literally to, to, to help people understand the holiness of God. And here's the other thing John was adamant about. John was adamant about humbling, distancing himself from the worth of the person and works of Jesus Christ. Listen to what he says. And he preached saying, after me comes he who is mightier than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. Now, now here's the thing. Here's the thing. Contextually, the slave that would have to care after the master's feet and the guest of the master was by far the lowest of the lowest slaves. It was, it was meant for the worst person. John says, I'm not even fit to do it. And this dude was chosen to be the messenger to tell the world about the Messiah. It's amazing. And here's the thing. Do you accept things or do you embrace them? There's a big difference. John embraced being the humble announcer and messenger for Jesus Christ. There, there was a time when, when John was gaining huge fame, which he didn't like, and then Jesus comes on the scene and some of John's disciples, John the Baptist, leaves and goes to be Jesus' disciples. It's remarkable. So people come to John the Baptist and say, hey man, uh, your disciples are leaving you and going to Jesus. He says something that we ought to say every morning. Real simple. He must increase, I must decrease. That word must there, it's of absolute necessity. John, John literally thought that him decreasing and Jesus increasing was more important than oxygen, than food, than water. He's like, it's of absolute necessity that I decrease and he increases. That's, that's how he answered it. Real simple. Folks, are, are, are we constantly doing that? John constantly rejected popularity. We're, we're gonna learn. So does Jesus. Jesus didn't wanna be popular either. Do we desire to be popular? Then as if John cannot go any further into the supremacy of Christ, he says this verse in eight, I've baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In other words, what John's saying is that, man, all I can do, all I can do is figuratively 
have you come in here and, and humble yourself and have this baptism in the River Jordan be indicative of you understanding that you have a massive problem with sins and you desperately need to be reconciled with your God in heaven. But man, this guy, this one coming, man, he's going to transform you. He's going to change you. And so being baptized in the Holy Spirit is, is literally conversion. That's, that's what it is. It's when we become a Christ follower. Again, Scripture is clear on this. There's no post-conversion uh, type thing that happens. And again, the writers are clear on this in Scripture. I mean, Jesus, he's having a dialogue with a guy named Nicodemus. One of the religious elite comes to him in John chapter 3 and asks him these questions. And Jesus says, you've got to be born again. And Nicodemus is like, what are you talking about? A man's got to enter his mother's womb for a second time? What are you talking about? And Jesus says this. Jesus answered, for truly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. It's clear. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. And he goes on to this. Hey, man, do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you don't know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. When we were going through the book of Ephesians, chapter one makes this clear. When Paul's writing the church in Ephesus in Ephesians 1.13, in him, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, that's that same Greek word right there, and believed in him, were sealed. That's a one and done forever. Forever. With the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. That's Jesus gives us salvation. John's statement must have thrilled Jewish believers because it was prophesied in Joel and others that God was gonna pour his spirit out on his nation. One of my favorite verses is found in Ezekiel. In Ezekiel 36, he says this in verse 26, and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh and I will put my spirit within you. And look at this, this is sanctification 101 right here. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. This supernatural power distinguishes this coming king from any other monarch that's ever come. Mark wants to make sure his readers understand who Jesus Christ and him crucified truly is. Now, here's the thing. The gospel's still getting played out, isn't it? Through his ecclesia. We learned in Ephesians, it's how God shows his manifold wisdom to the rulers in the heavenly places. They're looking down at the church, saying, man, I wonder what Hendersonville Church is gonna do today. It's still being lived out until it culminates when our king is returning, he is coming back. And again, I say it, when he comes back, he's not taking sides, he's taking over. And he's bringing his recompense with him. That's what Mark wants us to understand in these eight short verses right here. Again, Jesus, 100% man. Do you truly believe that? He is the Messiah and he's 100% God. This is the only way the cross works. It's the only way the cross works. It's the only way we get salvation. Make it clear, repentance. It's moving in a different direction. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. This is a lot of information I just did. What are we to do with it? Here's the thing. In everybody's life, we love to talk about a turning point. Mine was in Haiti. Mine was in Haiti. 2011, I think it was. God broke me into a billion pieces. Three months later, I found myself in Africa and he told me, Nathan, the only thing I want you to do from here on out is preach Jesus Christ, him crucified. I didn't know what I was doing. But here's the thing, folks. What's your defining moment? Because if it doesn't have Jesus Christ in it, it's rubbish. It's rubbish. I don't care what your defining moment is. If it doesn't have Jesus Christ and him crucified in it, what's your defining? And here's the other thing. What course are you on? What course are you following? Are you following the course of the world, of your flesh? And is the enemy whispering in your ear, you need that. You gotta have that. You gotta keep up with that person. You gotta do that. And are you listening to him? Are you talking about the things of God? And here's the thing, none of this makes sense if you're not God's kid. John the Baptist wanted to make sure that he was preparing people for the arrival 
of the King of Kings, of the Lord of Lords, of the Messiah, the suffering servant, the Son of God, the Son of Man, Jesus Christ. Now, here's the thing. It's like I just said, he's coming back. And when he comes back, it's game over. And here's the thing. I could drive home this afternoon and get head, head on and my life be over just like that. And the same could happen to you. And then comes the judgment. Here's all I want to say. If you're not God's kid, if you don't know that you're God's kid through the saving blood of Jesus Christ, please fill out a care card and let Ryan or me talk to you. Please. Folks, we are, the stakes are high. Is it your heart's delight to please God or man? Well, who do you want to please? Do you want to please God do you, or do you want to please man? Are you putting that promotion above God? Are you putting that extra decimal point in your retirement above God? Are you putting kids travel ball or dance ahead of God? We're gonna learn in the book of Mark. Get up, get ready. We're gonna learn. Jesus understands there are three different reactions to him. Those who are confused, those who are in the crowd, and they just want the power. By the way, God gives us zero power. You realize that, right? Zero. We have zero power. We have God inside of us. God does it all. Amen. People want the power. They want the blessing. They don't want the discipleship. Are you in a, in a, in a course of repentance? Because that's all John the Baptist preached was a baptism of repentance and confession of sins. Folks, let's surrender to God. Let's surrender to him. Let's wave the white flag and let's surrender and allow the Holy Spirit to sanctify us as only he can. Listen, there is no greater blessing than to be shaped and molded and crafted into the image of Christ by the gentle, beautiful working of the Holy Spirit inside of us. Which Jesus are you following? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, God, John the Baptist must have been a character lived in the wilderness, ate locusts and honey, just flat out called the Pharisees a brood of vipers. Wow. God, he had one objective though. And God, he wasn't perfect. There's only one person in the Bible that's perfect, and that's Jesus. But God, he had one purpose, and that was your will. And he proclaimed not a baptism of prosperity, not a baptism of power, not even a baptism of comfort or of health. God, he, he proclaimed a baptism of repentance. It's beautiful. God, may we, we focus on this. And God, may we resonate on it. To, to pray beautiful scriptures like, like Psalm 51 and, and Psalm 139, God, for you to search our heart and to point out any sin in our lives, whether that's bitterness or pride or, or lust or envy or unforgiveness, God, whatever it is. I can't get over your words in, in 2 Chronicles, God, where you say, if my people, if my people will humble themselves, turn from their wicked ways and seek my face. He didn't say if my adversaries, if people who don't know Jesus. No, no, no. He said if my people. God, those of us in here who are in Christ, we're your people. God, let us humble ourselves. Let us turn from things that are not your best for us. Let us seek your face. And God, you're clear. You will heal our land. Thank you for what your words taught us, God. And let us, God, walk out of here with the intent to not, just, to not just have a good feeling, to not just, you know, well, I'm gonna try to do, no, 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 God, it's not about that. It's about surrendering and resting in you. God, we love you. We pray all this in the name of Jesus, amen.